All right. Farron Gaffney's with me for security progress, securefreedom.org, counterjihad.com. Um, let's talk about, Frank, let's talk about um, uh, the, the Secretary of State Pompeo, who is uh, Center for Security Policy, by the way. And that's, I've got I've progressives in the brain, in the brain Frank. Center for Security Policy. Uh, the Secretary of State uh, Pompeo has really done an excellent job, and he's done something that is, you would think some of these geniuses in Washington could somehow navigate both the D.C. establishment and the MAGA economic and political and uh, geopolitical philosophy. Uh, and yet so few have done it. He's one who clearly has done it. And how has he done it, in your opinion? I think he's done it by having a very clear vision. You know, he's a principled guy, as well as one with a great pedigree. You know, he was the top in his class at West Point. He served with distinction in the Army. He ran a successful business in his native Kansas. He served in Congress. He became the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, served in that capacity for a year or so, and then took over this job at the State Department. So he's grounded in America. I mean, the heartland of America, the vision of America that Donald Trump speaks to so clearly. And that vision has, I think, seen unmistakably the threat posed to us by the Chinese Communist Party, not just today um, and not just in the past couple of years, Alex, but the one that has been inexorably building now for decades as the Chinese have executed. We've talked about this a lot. A strategy described in a book written in 1999 called unrestricted warfare. And it lists uh, a dozen or so different ways the Chinese Communist Party could destroy the United States of America without having to engage in the kind of conventional kinetic warfare that, particularly back then, they would have lost. So this is what we've seen coming to pass. Mike Pompeo, like President Trump, like Attorney General Bill Barr, um, like a few others, including, I guess, or at least maybe a convert to it very recently, yesterday, the FBI director now coming up on the net and describing, as, as Robert O'Brien has, a present danger from the Chinese Communist Party that must be regarded as such and responded to immediately, comprehensively by our country if we're to survive it. You know what else is interesting is that a lot of people like to play the game of who's going to succeed Trump uh, in the next era. And it's interesting because Pompeo is also a really crafty politician, and he's made inroads with tons of uh, people, not just in the Republican establishment, but also in the donor class and in the tech world and in Wall Street and in the media. And he's really someone who has a very large Rolodex. And uh, I would say at this moment, even though he gets – no one writes any pieces in Politico about how he's inevitably going to be the Republican nominee. But I would, I would say, Frank, that he is actually the front runner to be the Republican nominee in 2024. And I, I don't say this as someone who's particularly – his brand of politics doesn't particularly resonate with me relative to some of the others. Uh, but I think people have really underestimated what he's doing and how much – he accomplishes. He's clearly got a very agile brain that is working overtime constantly. I don't do politics, Alex, so I'm, I'm going to be probably no help to you here other than to say he certainly will have qualifications that are hard to match. Um, you know, the president was importuning him to get back into politics by running for a Senate seat in Kansas. And I think he seriously yeah. considered it. But um, I would guess he's somewhere on the ticket in 2024. But um, he could be the top guy. He could certainly be an extraordinarily able um, vice presidential candidate. But more importantly, for the time being, I pray he's going to stay in his present job and was delighted, really, that he yeah, decided not to way. take that Senate challenge up. Yeah, I'm with you. So uh, let's uh, a couple of things that he's looking at right now. First of all, the president finally pulled us out of the World Health Organization. Um, your your thoughts on that? I know it was a long time coming, but uh, glad to see it's happened. A long time coming, and it's certainly needed. Um, the information that keeps 
trickling out about the WHO's malfeasance and incompetence and complicity in what communist China did to us and the rest of the world for that matter. I mean, how many millions of people have been afflicted now with this disease? We've lost 120,000 plus Americans to it. And in part, that was because the WHO was telling us what the Chinese Communist Party clearly wanted uh, us to be told, but from that ostensibly independent, reliable source, that there was nothing to see here, folks. Move along. And for a critical period of time, it wasn't just the Chinese Communist Party that was lying about it. It was the WHO that was enabling those lies to be taken at face value. And uh, as a result, the, the rest of the world was unprepared, um, worse prepared, in fact, because during that period, um, the Chinese Communist Party, as you've talked about and reported on a lot, Alex, was scarfing up the world's supply of personal protective equipment and other medical gear that they didn't already have a corner on. So in these ways, I think um, the president is responding absolutely appropriately to the Chinese exploitation of, manipulation of, control over, effectively, this particular multilateral agency. Um, and it ought to be a sharp warning to the rest of them, uh, whether they are actually being run by Chinese Communist Party officials or whether they're simply doing their bidding, that we're not going to be the suckers paying the bulk of the freight for their budgets and being badly served by their uh, institutions. Okay, Frank, let's talk a little bit about the issue of Chinese social media and TikTok. TikTok has become a sensation around the world. Uh, I don't know why, really, it's very similar to Instagram. It's got these, people do these very short videos, a lot of times people are dancing, but it's owned by China. And this is something that is a problem. Mike Pompeo and the president has confirmed the U.S. is considering banning it. And it is, uh, I think they have uh, been, I, I think TikTok was operating in Hong Kong and now they're not. Um, tell us what we need to know about TikTok. Well, I'm not a guru on social media issues, but I can tell you, Alex, that what we've learned basically since China attacked India and murdered a number of Indian soldiers, um, and the government of India responded in a number of different ways, one of which was banning, I think it was something like 59 different Chinese apps, many of which, like TikTok, were very popular in India uh, as, uh, as they are here. I think that sort of moved to the forefront of American official consciousness that We've known for years uh, that uh, these telecommunications companies of China are penetrated uh, by the People's Liberation Army. Uh, the Pentagon actually revealed the other day that Huawei, one of these preeminent Chinese telecommunication conglomerates, is actually a People's Liberation Army company. You know, they deny it and they've, uh, you know, tried to get around it, that, but that's what it is. But TikTok, like all of these other entities, these arms of the Chinese Communist Party, is used to advance the party's interests. And what are their interests? In this case, it is collecting data. And people, as, as Mike Pompeo very directly said the other day to Laura Ingram, if you don't care whether you're turning over your personal data to a Chinese Communist Party company and therefore uh, Beijing. Go ahead, download that software, play with TikTok on your, on your devices. The trouble is, I think, that has national security implications, not just an infringement on your own personal privacy. Yeah, uh, this is something that I think people don't understand why all these high-tech apps are free. They're not free. The product is you. The product is your data. And that is something that is 
Uh, much like so many of the subtle indoctrinations that we're all going through in our life at any given moment, this is when I fear the most long-term geopolitically because uh, we're, we're – obviously, Frank, we're raising – Americans to be softer than prior generations. Uh, I think the way we've handled this pandemic has proven that beyond a reasonable doubt. In the meantime, our data is just getting gobbled up by some of the worst people on the planet, be it China, be it Silicon Valley. And it's the and, and this is where we're going to be very vulnerable long term if we don't start taking this seriously and taking our data and privacy seriously. Yeah. And let me give you a perfect example of this, Alex. Uh, we we're talking about the World Health Organization. One of the things that the Chinese have tried to do, as you know, in the aftermath of this pandemic they unleashed tom cotton put it very well deliberately intentionally and malevolently against us and the rest of the world is they're trying to position themselves to be the dominant force in the healthcare industry worldwide a friend and colleague of mine is uh, david goldman who has a new book just out called you will be assimilated which talks about basically that the various activities of the Chinese Communist Party, but particularly in this area of getting access to controlling, owning, utilizing, manipulating our personal information. By the way, Christopher Wray did a pretty good job yesterday talking about the extent to which they have hoovered up immense amounts of personal information about all of us from uh, the various uh, Equifaxes and uh, Office of Personnel Management and other accounts, but also through these kinds of techniques, Huawei and uh, TikTok. But they're using some of this to get access to healthcare data that can be in the wrong hands, not just an infringement on our privacy, but it can be weaponized against us. Just as we're seeing it weaponized, for example, in China itself at the moment, as you know, if you don't have an app on your phone that will show that you have a green, you know, uh, personal health code status, you will not be allowed out of your apartment. You will not be allowed onto public conveyances. You will not be allowed into public... Um, stores or spaces or offices or what have you. That kind of control, Alex, is something the Chinese are trying desperately to see if they can't get the rest of the world to adopt as well using their technologies, their software, their hardware, um, their programs. And they will, to be absolutely brutally honest about it, use that as part and parcel of their scheme to dominate the entire planet. That's a real problem, and we ignored it at our extreme peril. A very good point. Um, Frank Gaffney, again, is with me, Center for Security Policy Vice Chair of the Committee on the Present Danger China, presentdangerchina.org. Uh, let's talk more about Hong Kong and what's happening there. I, I, in my opening, I mentioned that this is one of the stories that would probably be dominating the news, the, uh, the, uh, the, how quickly communist China is reabsorbing Hong Kong at a breakneck pace, and yet we have no time to focus on this. What are the latest developments, and is there anything that can be done about it? Well, I personally don't think it's an accident, comrade, as the uh, Soviets used to say, that we're distracted, that that so little is being done in response to this chunk of the free world being sawed off and, and absorbed by one of the most horrific totalitarian regimes in world history. I think this is the direct result of this pandemic and all that it has unleashed, and now more recently, of course, the mayhem in our streets, in which, by the way, the Chinese Communist Party is also implicated. It's being brought to us, much of it, by institutions or organizations, I guess you'd call them, like you know, Antifa and Black Lives Matter, that have ties to you know, Maoist, Marxist operations in our country. These are the sorts of things that we, again, mistake uh, to our great detriment, Alex, and, and you ask the question, what can we do about it? Well, there's one really obvious play here. And if I could just tie it back to this you know, pronouncement of uh, Christopher Ray at the Hudson Institute yesterday, he's warning us that the Chinese are stealing us blind inside our own country. Well, how are they doing that? In part, they're doing it by the presence in our country of Chinese companies, all of which 
are subject to a so-called national intelligence law of China that says if the party tells you you will steal things, you will engage in espionage, you will engage in subversion, if you're a Chinese company or a Chinese national for that matter, you are duty bound to do it. And they, by the way, will punish you or your family if you don't. But this is particularly true, Alex, of People's Liberation Army companies like Huawei and so many others, some of which are actually the the principal institutions of the Chinese military industrial complex. And get this, as we've discussed before, the Pentagon has announced, has revealed that over 20 of these companies are doing business in the United States. You can bet they're stealing our stuff. You can bet they're subverting us. You can bet they're engaging in espionage. And President Trump, fortunately, under the law, has the ability with a stroke of the pen to shut them down, to send them packing, to eliminate that particular threat. And by the way, I believe that will have a profound effect on the others as well, especially on their ability to get access, another of our favorite topics, to our capital markets, which they're mm -hmm. using to underwrite all of this bad stuff. So these are the sorts of things that we could do, and I think it would have a very important signal to the Chinese Communist Party that there will be real costs to them for what they're doing to Hong Kong, in addition to uh, what they've been trying to do to our national security. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I'm looking at some of these headlines from Hong Kong, and they're just they're very disturbing. Hong Kong police collecting DNA from pro-democracy protesters. Schools and libraries begin banning books under a Chinese new security law, which I'm told is very mild uh, from yeah, the Chinese that's what Carrie Lam media. Says. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Nothing but to see here, folks. They're, they're, very mild. It's only going to be bad for a few people, question. is the point. But those yeah, few just, people just, will be the uh, the canaries in the mine shaft for everybody else, and they will. And what I know, know about communism and totalitarianism in general is that uh, whenever the communists tell you that something is going to be a certain way, that's exactly how it turns out, and it never goes beyond that, which is good it, because uh, if not, we'd be concerned that this is the beginning of something very dark and scary. Um, so that's good. So you can uh, allay your fears. Um, but go back it to does sleep. Feel like that is pretty amazing that we are suffering through a pandemic that China unleashed upon the globe, and at the meantime they are able to try to take territory in other parts of um, their sphere of influence without the world media getting able, being able to focus on it. And as you say, it, it cannot be coincidental completely. No, it's part of a design, and they may not pull it off because it seems as though increasingly people are recognizing what Xi Jinping is up to and are beginning to um, take you know, some actions to make that more costly to him. And again, I just have to say, this is a moment when the Chinese Communist Party has made absolutely clear they intend to defeat Donald Trump. They will engage in, you know, all this talk about Russian interference in the 2016 election. It was nothing. Well, I think it was nothing, period. But it was nothing by comparison to what the Chinese are actually doing right now, let alone what they may yet do. You know, Alex, one of the things that seems a distinct possibility, one of our other Committee on the Present Danger of China members is a fellow by the name of Kevin Freeman, who does extraordinary work on economic warfare. And he says, you know, back in that book I mentioned a moment ago, in 1999, unrestricted warfare lays out the strategy of an attack on our capital markets using, you know, a, a man-induced crash of the stock market to affect politics, to, to encourage rioting in the streets and all kinds of mayhem. That could very well happen. One of the things Kevin Freeman suggests, and I would commend to President Trump, is something called the uptick rule, a practice that was used for decades in our stock markets to try to prevent people from doing these mass runs on our capital markets, especially using now automated systems for doing it, which the Chinese could and I believe are perfectly capable of doing to destroy what's left of Donald Trump's re-election prospects. This is a hostile regime bent on the destruction of our country. And um, I think you all had a piece about uh, Elmer uh, Yuan, a Chinese-American, uh, now he's working in this country trying to oppose what the Chinese are doing to his um, adopted city of Hong Kong. And he's warned that, you know, Joe Biden would be the end of America 
in this respect, because it would be unmistakably a flashing green light for China to take over the world. And they're on their way to trying to do it, that's for sure. And this is perhaps our last chance to prevent them from getting away with it. Yeah, this is an interesting story uh, that we had at Breitbart. And this is one where this is a Chinese businessman who is suggesting that the communists would have won against the free world if Joe Biden wins. And I think there's got to be some truth to it because Biden's cozied up to China. Uh, he is clearly does not see China as a major threat. He's focused on Russia, which is a rapidly contracting uh, economy that somehow gotten in the head of the Democrats such an insane level because they never accepted the 2016 election. But uh, what do you mean by the, the, the communists have won, Frankie, uh, Biden gets in? Let me just give you one example, Alex. When Joe Biden was vice president of the United States, he was not only famously given the portfolio of dealing with Ukraine, and we learned a lot about that, didn't we? He was also given the China portfolio. And the Chinese went after him to arrange for a means by which they would be able to tap our capital markets, as we were just talking about, that was so preferential that no American company <clears throat> had the right to do it. For example, Joe Biden engineered something called a Memorandum of Understanding back in May of 2013 that allowed the Chinese companies to have access to our stock and debt markets without having to go through the same auditing procedures that American companies do. That meant effectively they were able to just give a miss to the whole securities laws and regulations of our companies of our country designed to protect our investors from fraud or material risk or simply just getting massively ripped off and lots of them have been by the way thanks to joe biden that's the kind of deal that i believe um the chinese would expect to get big time should he become president of the United States. There's some reason to believe that it might be cause and effect that his son Hunter got $1.5 billion for engineering this $3 trillion sweetheart deal for the Chinese. I don't know. We ought to look into it. But at the very least, they would expect to be rewarded even more massively by a Biden presidency because he's a friend of China. Very interesting and scary stuff from Frank Gaffney, Center for Security Policy, securefreedom.org, counterjihad.com. Frank, thank you, my friend. We'll talk to you next week. I look forward to it, Alex. Thank you.